we looked at the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits. We see how those three feasts have been fulfilled. And uh, we come uh, to the last feast that was fulfilled out of the seven feasts. The last three feasts still have to be fulfilled. This is the Feast of Pentecost, and it takes place on the 6th of the third month, which is the month of Sivan. Now, this feast called Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost, was originally a festival of um, thanks for the Lord uh, blessing the harvest. But um, it's tied into the giving of the Ten Commandments and uh, bears the name Matim Torah, or the giving of the law. And Jews believe that it was exactly at this time that God gave the Torah, the Pentateuch, or the law of Moses to the people, the first five books of the Bible. They believe it was exactly that, at that time throughout Jewish history it's been customary to engage in all-night study of the Torah on the first evening of Shavuot. Children are encouraged to memorize scripture and were rewarded with treats. And the book of Ruth was traditionally read during that period as well. Now, just to give you a little bit of the historical background, they also um, celebrated as the birth of the nation of Israel. So Shavuot is believed by rabbinic scholars to be the day that God gave Moses the Torah or the law on Mount Sinai after their exodus from Egypt. Although possible, the giving of the law on the 6th of 7 is not confirmed by scripture. However, if you look in Exodus 19 verse 1, it says on the first day, which would have been five days before the Pente uh, Feast of Pentecost, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. So it's obviously right in the very um, time of Pentecost that they arrived at Sinai, where they were given the law. Now, the Feast of Pentecost has parallels with the way a Jewish bridegroom made a covenant, and that covenant is called a ketubah, uh, and um, it's very interesting to see how so much of uh, what has been fulfilled has been shadowed and laid out in type in Scripture. And I believe that the Lord does this on purpose. And that's why even as Gavin shared last week about Jesus rising on the third day, it's just so amazing how over and over in Scripture the Lord has shown us certain things. I was really just thanking the Lord last night for the Bible College because it's been such a source of enrichment, not only to the people who come in, it's been a source of enrichment to me. Uh, I know Gavin's also finding it quite tough to do all the preparations because Gavin's not only, um, you know, doing this, he's also once a month goes to Nicholas's Bible College and Gavin's got all the marking to do because with assignments, you've got to have continuity. But um, in saying that, it's like, you know, sometimes up two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning doing preparation, it's a blessing. It's really a blessing to have to get into the Word of God. And when you get into it, you actually enjoy it so much. So it's actually good to discipline yourself to get into the Word of God. Now, Wikipedia says this about a ketubah. A ketubah is a Jewish marriage contract. It is considered an integral part of a traditional Jewish marriage. The out, uh, it outlines the rights and the responsibilities of the groom in relation to the bride. In modern practice, the ketubah has no agreed monetary value and it is seldom enforced by civil courts except in Israel. So that's what a ketubah is. It's a marriage contract. So at Mount Sinai, God entered into a marriage contract with Israel. It's a marriage contract which they broke. And in the time of uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah was told by the Lord, give the, 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 the Jews a bill of divorce, divorcement because they have broken the contract. Now, a covenant to a ketubah took place at Mount Sinai when God made a covenant with Israel in the month of Sivan, the month of Pentecost. This contract could not be fulfilled by Israel, but God had plans for a new covenant, not like the one at Sinai. On the day of Pentecost, God sent his Holy Spirit to write his new covenant on the hearts of the church that was born as 3,000 souls were saved. Now we need to differentiate between entering into that marriage contract and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
because we'll see that there is more to it than just the ketubah. Now, the Old Covenant was a marriage contract written on tablets and sealed with the sprinkling of blood. In Exodus 24, verse 1 to 8, it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and, the 70, and 70 of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at the distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near. The people may not come up with him. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice. Everything the Lord has said, we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and he put it in bowls. The other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Very reminiscent of what happened when Jesus said, this cup is the cup of the new uh, covenant in my blood, which he said for you. And as we are born again, we enter into that covenant. We say like the Israelites said, everything that you've written on our hearts, everything that your spirit has impressed upon us, we will do. That's the covenant we enter into. But it says this in Jeremiah about the old covenant. God said in Jeremiah 31, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. The new covenant we see in Hebrews 8, verse 10. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now, after a bridegroom gave his bride a contract, this ketubah, he would give her gifts, and the gifts from the bride's groom would be called a matan, and the father would give her gifts as well, called a shaluhim. These gifts sustained his bride for the duration of their separation until they got married. The gift given by Jesus and the Holy Spirit in this regard was the gift of the Holy Spirit to sustain his bride. And this was fulfilled at Pentecost when the 120 people were waiting in the upper room. Remember, Jesus had already met with the disciples on the day of his resurrection. He had breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. There is a work of the Holy Spirit that's done when we enter into that covenant, when we enter into that contract. Remember the Jews when they entered into a marriage contract and were betrothed, it was like a marriage. That's why it speaks of um, Mary and Joseph. And when Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant, they hadn't got married yet. He wanted to put her away quietly. He wanted to divorce her because that's how serious this marriage contract was. Okay. So although the marriage supper of the Lamb is something that is still to take place, and we believe that the Feast of Trumpets, the next uh, feast, will be when Jesus comes back for his bride. He has already entered into that contract with us. And this promise was given in Joel. Well, there's a number of references in the Old Testament where the Lord speaks about him sending his spirit into his people. But here in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, it says, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. 
even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So here we come to the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, 10 days after his ascension. So 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, on the Feast of Pentecost, 120 disciples were praying in the upper room, when in fulfillment to what Jesus said, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Then G uh, Peter preached to the crowd that gathered, and 3,000 souls were saved. So on that day, the church, the bride of Christ, came into existence, as God established a new covenant with those who placed their faith and their trust in him. Now, how did Jesus fulfill this Feast of Pentecost? Well, when he went down to get baptized by John the Baptist, this is what John the Baptist says in John 1. But I, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water, in other words, God who had sent him, told me the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. John said, I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. Now, going to the book of Leviticus, we see how the Jews were commanded to keep this feast. It says in Leviticus 23 and verse 15 to 21, it speaks about these feasts. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, in other words, the first fruits, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Now remember the Feast of First Fruits took place on the 17th of Nisan when Jesus rose from the dead. And he, in fulfillment of what was typified by the priest going and presenting the wave offering in the temple, went and presented the wave offering to God. We saw the first fruits of the resurrection took place on, uh, at that same time that Jesus went up and presented this wave offering. So they are told to count 50 days, in other words, seven Sabbaths. Remember, Jesus rose on the day after the Sabbath. So seven Sabbaths is 49, and the day after would have been 50. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two-tenths of an ephah, and they shall be your fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. Now notice these loaves have got leaven in. They're not an unleavened. They are the first fruits to the Lord. Now, the term Pentecost actually means 50. Pente stands for five. So God told the Israelites to count off seven Sabbaths. That's why they call this feast the Feast of Weeks as well. So it's not only called Shavuot, it's also called the Feast of Weeks. Then on the day after the seventh Sabbath, which was the 50th day, they were to bring to the temple two loaves of bread made with fine flour and baked with leaven. These two loaves of bread were to be used as a wave offering for the people. Now, what is the significance of these two loaves? Loaves represent a real union of particles made into one body. Two loaves may represent the Jews and the Gentiles. That's what I believe they do. And the leaven is typical of the sin which is still in the church. So the church, remember, is not just uh, Gentiles. In fact, the church that was birthed on the day of Pentecost were Jews that had come from all over the empire and uh, all over, from all over, because remember, three times a year, all males had to come to the feast. And that's why when they heard these people speaking in tongues, they say, we hear these people speaking in our languages because they'd come from all these different places. Now, in Ephesians 2, verse 13 and 14, what does it say? But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, us as Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both them to God through the cross by which he put to death 
the hostility. So on the day of Pentecost, which took place 50 days after the feast of, well, uh, 49 days after the feast of um, first fruits, but um, after the Sabbath, it was before that, it was 50 days. Um, there was a great harvest of souls as um, the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out. And uh, it was once again pointing to the fact that during the kingdom age, there would be this great harvest, not only of Gentiles, but even of Jews that would come into the kingdom and that would be part of the new covenant. Now, these are the feasts we've looked at in the last couple of weeks. We saw that the Passover had to do with our justification, being made right with God. The Feast of Unleavened Bread had to do with sanctification, and the Feast of First Fruits had to do with consecration. So the Passover dealt with our position, our position before God, and brought us into peace with God. The Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of First Fruit dealt with our condition because the Lord now has to change people who have been living sinful lives and He has to change us. We still have a sinful nature. And as we are sanctified and as God deals with us, you know what happens is we have the peace of God. We end up knowing that as we yield to Him, as He puts His finger on things in our lives that are wrong, we just have that peace that passes all understanding. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread had to do with putting off the old man. And the Feast of First Fruits had to be do with putting on the new man. Okay, so it's all typified in the feasts. But now we come to the Feast of Pentecost, and this has to do with empowerment. And it has to do with not our position, not our condition, but our commission. We have been empowered to go and take the gospel to the nations. So... In Mark chapter 2, 22, we see why it was necessary for these other three feasts. Why was it necessary for the Feast of Passover, for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for the Feast of First Fruits? Because Jesus said no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. And that's why God makes us new creatures so that we can be filled with his spirit. Now, just coming to some personal aspects of the feast, and this is not the feast of um, first fruits. This is the feast of uh, Pentecost. Uh, sorry, I'll have to correct that. First of all, you must repent. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 to 39, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the, forgiveness of, for the forgiveness of your sins. So this is entering into that contract. You are being baptized. Okay. And remember the baptism spoken of uh, when it speaks about salvation is baptism into the body of Christ. Baptism in water is symbolic of that. So we symbolizing that we've died to self and we are now living a resurrection life. And it says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off whom our God will call. So the promise is for everyone. In Acts chapter 5, 32, Peter says, we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. It's not a reward, but the fact of the matter is, but when we obey him and when we come and we surrender our lives to him, he gives us this gift. Just as the bridegroom would give his bride gifts to sustain her, so God has, through Jesus, baptized us with the Holy Spirit to sustain us until he comes to fetch us for his marriage ceremony. The second thing that you need to do is you must ask. It says in Luke 11, verse 9 to 13, so I say to you, and it's not just a case of ask. There's got to be determination. There's got to be persistence. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened 
For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So God gives the Holy Spirit to people who are evil. Okay. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit? We don't get the Holy Spirit. We don't get salvation. We don't get anything from God on our merit, on the basis of what we've done. The only good that comes out of our lives is the good that comes when he changes us and he changes our nature. And we can't take credit for that because that's the Holy Spirit living out the life of Christ in and through us. The next thing that's important if you want to receive this gift and experience this Pentecost experience is you must be thirsty. There must be a desire. Now, what must your desire be? What was the purpose for the Holy Spirit? Was the purpose of the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues? No. The purpose of the Holy Spirit was empowerment so that we could be witnesses. So I want to ask you the question this morning. Do you have a desire to share Christ with others? Do you have a desire to evangelize, to witness? If you don't, why would you need the Holy Spirit? Because this is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And so it says in John 7, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and he said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who received him, who believed in him, were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And I believe that when Jesus is glorified in our lives, then we are ready to receive the Holy Spirit. And when he is glorified, he's glorified when he takes the throne. We saw the example of Zacchaeus. It didn't take Zacchaeus weeks, months, years. Jesus went into him, and when he came out, he was a changed man. He said, half of my goods I give to the poor. If I've robbed any man, I'll give him back four times what I've taken. And Jesus said, salvation has come into this house today. Why? Because he has a new creature. Jesus is glorified in this man's life. And that's what happens at salvation. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Galatians 6, 5 says, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. Circumcision, uncircumcision, it means nothing. What matters, what counts, is the new creation. That's why it says that he is not a Jew who has been circumcised outwardly, but he is a Jew who has been circumcised inwardly, the circumcision of the heart. Because circumcision just became an outward ceremony. In fact, when you were eight, years, eight days old, you got circumcised. You didn't have much choice in it. And so in our modern day and age, baptism means absolutely nothing if you are not a new creation. If it is not symbolizing the fact that you have died to self and you've allowed the resurrected life of Christ to be manifested in your life. Titus 3, 5, it says he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth the renewal by the Holy Spirit. So that work at salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who renews us and makes us new creatures. But the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is this. Jesus instructed his disciples not to embark on the great commission he had given them until they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Luke 24 verse 49, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. In Acts chapter 1 verse 4 to 8, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, 
do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the empowerment comes so that we can fulfill our commission. And here we see on Act, in Acts 2 the fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, listen, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Remember we saw in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, in the last days God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. God has raised this Jesus to life, he goes on to say in verse 32 and 33. And we are witnesses. We are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So the Holy Spirit is poured out. And you know, there are gifts that have been given to the church, the ascended Christ. He gave gifts. It says, he who descended in Ephesians 4 is the same who ascended. And he has given gifts, pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists, apostles, for the perfecting of the saints, for works of service. We see the Gifts of the Spirit that have been given. These are all uh, gifts that have been given to sustain the new covenant people until the Lord Jesus comes. So with this baptism and this infilling of the Holy Spirit comes so much. Now the Old Testament revealed a shadow of the things to come through Christ. After Moses went up to Mount Sinai, the word of God was given to the Israelites at Shavuot, or Feast of Pentecost. When the Jews accepted the Torah, they became servants of God. Similarly, after Jesus went up to heaven, Moses went up the mountain, Jesus went up to heaven, the Holy Spirit was given at Pentecost. When the disciples received the gift, they became witnesses for Christ. Jews celebrated a joyous harvest on Shavuot, and the church celebrated a harvest of newborn souls, 3,000 that were added to the body of Christ. So on this annual feast of Shavuot, God once more descended as he had at Sinai. This time on the first century believers, with a mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire, and other demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. Again establishing a covenant with his people. The feast of Passover had to do with the peace with God. The feast of unleavened bread and the feast of first fruits had to do with the peace of God. But this feast, the Feast of Pentecost, had to do with the power of God. Now, in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, remember, we've already looked at this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And you know what was said of these uh, disciples, these ones that were part of the early church? The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders of the Jews said, these men are turning the world upside down. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes. Now this is an article from Charisma magazine, Evangelistic Zeal. Being full of the Holy Spirit and winning the lost go hand in hand. 
Pentecostals read the book of Acts and believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are available for them today. They observe that the early church was focused on evangelism and believe they must behave and respond in the same way. Evangelism is their primary goal. Because of this focus, Pentecostal mission programs have dramatically entered unconverted areas of the world, often at great risk, believing God would enable them to reach these areas for Christ. What is our desire? Do we desire to reach the lost? Is the baptism of the Holy Spirit some badge that you get? You know, if you go to scouts or whatever, you go through some sort of course or whatever, and you get another badge, and then you get another badge. Sometimes people think that the Holy Spirit is just some badge that you wear, and, you know, I'm a spiritful Christian. It's sadly far short of what God has envisaged for us. I want to look at a number of aspects in the lives of people that were filled with the Holy Spirit. If you are spirit-filled, and why I say spirit-filled is because spirit-filled is a condition that has to be sustained. It's not something that happens once off. You will see later on, we see in Ephesians 5 where it says, don't be drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you get drunk today, it doesn't mean you're going to be drunk tomorrow or the day afterwards. Okay. So the fullness of the Holy Spirit is dependent upon a daily encounter with the Lord. Acts 4, 13 and 14. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men, they marveled. They realized that they had been with Jesus and seen the man who had been healed standing with them. They could say nothing against it. In Acts chapter 4, remember they had been threatened. They had been brought in and told not to preach in the name of Jesus. And it says, Now, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You know why it's important to be a new creation? You know why it's important to see sin as God sees it? Is because this is Acts chapter 4. The very next chapter we go into Acts chapter 5, and Ananias and Sapphira are struck down dead for lying to the Holy Spirit. Their lie was that they were pretending that they were giving all that they had from the proceeds of this property that they sold. And Peter said, the property was yours. But all of it was yours. You didn't have to give it all. You didn't have to give some of it. You could have kept it all. But he says, what you've done is you've pretended to give the whole amount. And they were struck down dead. And I always look at that and I think that, you know, people pray sometimes, Lord, send your spirit. What would happen if the Holy Spirit had to be poured out like he was on the day of Pentecost to the present day church? I'm sure you've had some electrical appliance at home that's had a faulty cord. And you don't go and plug that in. Because if you do, you can shock yourself and you can die. Or you can start a fire or whatever the case may be. So the church needs to pray, Lord, we want to fix the connection. We want to deal with the sin in our lives. And that's why the other feasts are important so that we can be prepared to be vessels that can be filled with God's Spirit. Because sin is dealt with severely when God impresences Himself. If you are spiritful, you will overcome temptation. Luke 4, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Remember, John said, I saw the Spirit descend upon him like a dove. Remember, Jesus, whatever he did, he didn't do as the third person of the Godhead. He did as a man. He lay aside his deity. He came in humanity, and whatever he did, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. If you're spiritual, you'll be able to serve. Act 6, the Hellenistic Jews, among them, complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. We don't look at that as a very important ministry in Pentecostal circles. People don't consider handing out food, a, 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 um, a job that requires people that are filled with the Holy Spirit. But notice the qualifications that God gives for people that perform this ministry. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to the prayer and the ministry of the Word. One of these men who was chosen was a man called Stephen. If you're spiritful, God can use you in the miraculous. So one of these seven men chosen to wait on tables, this is what it says about him. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. If you're spirit-filled, you'll be able to face death. Because this very same man, Stephen, it says this in Acts chapter 7. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And many believe that this was the moment that God started to do a work in the life of Saul, who became Paul, who wrote the majority of our New Testament. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. If you're filled with the spirit, you'll have joy. Acts 13, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jewish leaders incited God-fearing women of high standing and leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. So they shook their dust off, the feet, off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Just imagine you have an unsuccessful meeting. You go and people chase you out of town. And you go out rejoicing, filled with joy. So often our joy and the way we feel is dependent on our circumstances. What type of meeting we had. We need to have joy in the face of persecution. We need to have joy in the face of death. Ephesians 5. Verse 18 to 20, it says, Do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what should be flowing from the life of men and women that are filled with the Spirit of God. Now, historically... These feasts that we have looked at have been fulfilled. The Feast of Passover, you recognize that guy, Martin Luther, 
1916, he protested the sale of indulgences, which triggered the Protestant Reformation. A vital truth was restored to the church, justification by faith, the feast of Passover. Then these two men, brothers, the Wesley brothers, through them, and they, um, the, the early Methodist church was led. They were um, the leaders of this missional movement. Their mission was not a form, um, what was not to form any sect, but to reform a nation, particularly the church, to spread spiritual holiness over the land. They actually never even broke away from the Church of England. They were actually um, a society. But these uh, two men preached personal holiness. And, uh, you know, I was reading a number of these early stories and really amazing to see how these guys, they took the communion so seriously that if somebody hadn't been living properly, they wouldn't allow them to break bread. Then in 1906, William Seymour arrived to preach at the Nazarene Church. He was not received because of his Pentecostal message. He started holding meetings in a converted livery stable at 312 Azusa Street. There was a mighty revival that lasted for three years. This revival launched the modern day Pentecostal movement. And so the Feast of Pentecost has been restored and that reform has taken place in the church. So all four feasts that have been fulfilled, there's been reformation in the church and these truths have been restored to the church. Now let's look at a number of other instances. There are five instances of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, well in scripture, they're all in the book of Acts. The first one we've seen is the one that took place in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. But if we look at Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10, while Peter was still preaching to them, the Holy Spirit came on all who had heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out, even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then we have in, if, um, in uh, Acts chapter 19, the account of the Ephesian believers. It says in Acts chapter 19, verse 1 to 6, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Now remember, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, and it was prior to Jesus dying on the cross. John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe on the one coming after him, that is, Jesus. So Paul asked them, what baptism does you receive? Okay, sorry. Um, it looks like a duplication that I had. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So these people that were believed, and had only been baptized with John's baptism, were now baptized again in water with Jesus' baptism, because Jesus' baptism portrays something different. It portrays dying to self, as Jesus died, and coming up out of the water, and living a new resurrection life. And once that had taken place, then they prayed for them for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And once again, we see tongues, and in this case, prophecy. Okay. So what is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? We've seen that there should be power demonstrated in the lives of those who are spirit-filled. And I'd like to differentiate being between being spirit-filled and having been baptized in the Holy Spirit some time years ago. Boldness, joy should be demonstrated, at times even the miraculous, 
and in some cases even a willingness to die for their faith. However, speaking in tongues occurs in three out of the five instances that are mentioned in Scripture of the initial baptism of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, we looked at, we've just looked at Cornelius and his household, and we've looked at the Ephesian believers. But there's another occasion. There's the baptism of the Holy Spirit where Paul was baptized, where Ananias was told to go and lay hands on Paul, and he would receive his sight, and he would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And there's the one in Acts chapter 8, where we see Simon the sorcerer offering the apostles money to have this gift. So let's look at those remaining two. Paul, in Acts chapter 9, it says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now there's no mention of what happened. We, obviously Paul received his sight and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But although there is no mention of that, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. But he goes on to say this, and we need to take note of this, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, he's obviously exaggerating, uh, you know, using the 10,000. But the importance is that the church is not edified by tongues unless there is an interpretation. And so in 1 Corinthians 14, he instructs them that they shouldn't speak in tongues unless there's an interpretation. And he says that it shouldn't take place more than three times. So he says when people come in, um, they need to be able to understand what's going on in the church. Okay, speaking in tongues, the primary purpose, I believe, and Scripture bears this out, is for self-edification. Praying with the understanding, praying with the Spirit. Even when we don't know what to pray, we can pray in tongues. Okay, so there is a purpose for tongues. And uh, the purpose, as far as the church is concerned, is limited and controlled by Scripture. The only other occasion, then, of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is Acts chapter 8. Now, here we read in verse 14 onwards, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So these are believers, and that's why they were sent there, because these people had believed, and now... They were sent there to go and pray for them for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So these people had been baptized in water, but not baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, it doesn't say what happened, but something happened. Because it says here, in verse 18 onwards, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, they off he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Now, although there's no reference to speaking in tongues or some other manifestation of the Spirit, it is almost certain that something out of the ordinary happened here to prompt Simon to offer Peter money to be able to pray for people to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Assemblies of God USA, if you go onto their website, you will see that part of their statement of faith is that they do believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. And I'm of a similar persuasion. How else would we know that we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Goosebumps? You can get goosebumps from going outside without a jersey on or from watching a nice movie. Okay, so the Lord gave a sign on three out of the five occasions, which was speaking in tongues. And I believe that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, you can establish something as a truth. We need to be filled on an ongoing basis. Acts chapter 4, verse 29 to 31. Now, Lord, consider 
their threats. Enable your servants to speak the word of God with great boldness. We've looked at this as well. And it says the place they were in was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word boldly. These are people that in Acts chapter 2 had been filled with the Holy Spirit and they had spoken in tongues. Now again in Acts chapter 4, they filled again. So the filling of the Holy Spirit is not a once-off experience. That's why it says in Ephesians 5.18, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that be filled is in the continuous in the Greek. Be being filled. So it's something that you've got to sustain. I want to know, what does your tank look like this morning? When last did you go for a filling up? Now, I mentioned the AOG website earlier on. I just want to read something from the news section on tongues. It's just this page. Yeah, I think is vital to bring to the attention of people that have been prayed for, have been filled with the Spirit sometime in the past, but they've got no passion for souls. There is no evidence of the Holy Spirit operating in their life. The Lord doesn't want us just to survive, just to hang in there until the rapture. What are we doing? Are we sitting on the bench waiting for the rapture? Is tongues the only evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Will there be any significant changes in one's attitude and actions after being baptized in the Holy Spirit? The first physical sign of the infilling of the Spirit is speaking in tongues. This is the one physical sign that is consistent in its recurrence, as pointed out earlier. However, the baptism is not a goal, but a gateway. It is a door to a spiritful, to spiritual living. It marks a beginning not an end. Speaking in tongues is but the initial evidence and is to be followed by all the evidences of Christ-likeness that mark a consistent spiritual life. The Apostle Paul described this wonderful life in the, in the Spirit. In Acts 5, 22 and 23, he wrote the fruit of the Spirit, his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that is the fruit that comes out of a life that is filled with the Spirit. It is a life to be lived, not just an experience to be remembered. Some have missed this essential distinction. They have been satisfied to recall that wonderful moment when the Holy Spirit came in His fullness. And they have magnified the Lord and they magnify the Lord in other tongues. Failure to progress beyond that point is a tragedy. So we've seen the Feast of Passover has been fulfilled. The Feast of Unleavened Bread has been fulfilled. The Feast of First Fruits has been fulfilled. And now we see the Feast of Passover has been fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled all four feasts. Our Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, has died. He has taken away the leaven, the sin of the world. He has risen as the first fruits of the resurrection, together with many other Old Testament believers. And he has baptized the New Testament believers with the Holy Spirit on the Feast of Pentecost. And he continues to do so today, to sustain his bride until he comes. So those four feasts have taken place. They've been fulfilled. We are now in the time of the Gentiles. We are now in the church age. And we're waiting for our bridegroom. And he's coming soon. Amen.